This is Eastman's Elevated Podcast. I have on great guests that are really knowledgeable, consistently successful. We're able to dive deep down the rabbit holes of these different subject matters of shooting, of physical fitness, of mental toughness and drive. All the different skills that make up a complete hunter that you can become. Here's your host, Brian Barney. Hey, what's happening, guys? Oh, I got a brand new podcast for you. So um, this week, Eastman's Elevated. I have back on Stephen Ross. Um, so I met Stephen through the podcast. Uh, he's a Wyoming resident. The guy's just an absolute killer. Uh, he spent tons of time guiding and then um, spends tons of time hunting for himself. Um, he was just published in the newest Eastman's Hunting Journal that's going to be coming out. Um, he's got his giant buck and his giant bull that he killed from last year, both um, general season for Wyoming residents. Um, man, just guy is an absolute killer. He just scouts like a madman. And so we get him back on the podcast and, you know, it's just, uh, this, this organic, authentic conversation where we get talking. He's got like one of the premier late season elk tags in Wyoming, like one of the toughest ones to draw best tags you can have. And so it's fun to talk to him, how he's preparing, what his game plan is. And it is extreme gnarly country in the snow, in the cold. And he talks about these bulls hanging up high, just a great conversation. And then, um, we get into mule deer. He's such a mule deer guy like me. Um, he spends a ton of time scouting, hunting with his bow, and then um, he's uh, he killed that last buck with his rifle. You know, he just like he had like ten scouting trips in for that buck. So uh, we really dive into early season scouting for mule deer and dissect that. So some really good information there. And then talk about this goat tag he has. So anyways, I'm giving away the whole podcast, but it's a great one with Steven. You guys are really going to enjoy it. I know I did. Sponsor for today's show is Six Hour Optics. Um, Six Hour Optics are great. I've been using them the last couple years. Um, this year, I'm using their range-finding binoculars, and I... I really like their range finders. They're, they're just the most accurate on the market. Light and dark targets. They do angles. Just great for a bow hunter. So I'm going to use the system this year with binoculars and range finders in them. Uh, maybe eliminate a step and uh, see how that works. So I'm super excited to be using those. Um, I've used their binoc their other binoculars um, before. Just great optics. Um and great color fidelity, and uh, they're really crisp. And then, um, like I say, I'm a huge fan of their their range finders. Um, and then they have like what this this BDX system. And this BDX system, you can use it with just a range finder and an app on your phone, or you can use it with a range finder and your scope on your rifle in your phone, and they all talk together to help figure your holdover with the conditions and how far it is. Um, it's really technical, but I'm sure as you got into it and got it all figured out, like, man, oh man, would you have a great working system. But this BDX system, um, it's really cool for, for rifle hunting. So uh, make sure to check them out if you're in the market for, for a rangefinder, for binoculars, for rifle scope. Um, they're building great products. And over there at Eastman's, um, gosh, we're just uh, going to town here. It's a real exciting part of season when we start to figure out what tags everybody has and what hunts everybody's going on. Uh, we're trying to film. Um, we're trying to figure out which ones we're going to film. You know, I'm definitely going to do a couple, and then um, the other ones I'm just going to cut my legs loose and go for it, try to kill a big critter. But, uh, yeah, it's just fun time at the office. I've been fishing with Todd, my editor. Uh, laid down a really good podcast with him the other day. And, um, yeah, he's got me a couple articles here coming up, um, for the Eastman's bow hunting journal and then the Eastman's hunting journal. So they're keeping me busy behind the pen, which I really like. So, um, writing a couple of those articles I'm excited about, get my pictures together, get those things turned in. Um, I fly out a week from tomorrow, uh, to Hawaii to go hunt, uh, moof lawns and axis. So, um, to say I'm a little pumped is an understatement. <laughs> I'm ready to grab my bow and um, start this fall off right. So, yeah, getting together with my really good buddies in Hawaii, too. Um, it's going to be really fun to see them. I'm out there for quite a few days, going to soak in some sunshine. We haven't had hardly any sunshine here in Montana, so um, I know it's going to be hot. i got to ramp up my heat training. i got to be like sauna in my sauna at least a couple times a day. So I didn't do this morning. Um 
But yeah, I need to ramp it up, make sure I'm ready for that 90 degree heat, give myself a short haircut, clean shave, just uh, ready to go sweat on lanai, make sure I bring tons of water. So uh, that's going to be really fun. Really looking forward to it. And um, so yeah, start off the season there. Just found out I got my antelope tag. Good to go there. Um, But yeah, let's get this podcast rolling. This is just a great conversation between me and Steven and and, um, talking about his season and uh, touch on mine a little bit and uh, just a great podcast. So here we go. Uh, Eastman's Elevated, Steven Rosso. um, Here we go. What's up, Brian? Hey, Steven. How are you? Good, man. How are you? Good. You've been keeping busy? Yeah, working too much and uh, trying to get out as much as I can. You know how it goes. Uh, that dang work gets in the way of good fun, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Seems like it every time. <laughs> uh, necessary yeah. evil, though. Guys got to pay bills. Yeah, I agree. And pay for that gas money. Yeah, exactly. Got to pay for a reason to buy all the toys we need to get up in the high country. Oh, isn't that the truth? Well, um, <laughs> congratulations, man. We were texting a little bit before the podcast, and sounds like you got some great hunts planned for this year. Yeah, stoked. Uh, just the draws were good to me and everything, and then just some, you know, a couple of over-counter tags like usual, but I got lucky on some tags I really did not plan on drawing, so it's kind of made me realize I'm basically going to be off the grid for most of the fall in the hills whenever I don't have to be at work. Oh, good for you. So you're just putting in your time now to be gone in the fall. Well, yeah, I don't have, it's, I'm still going to be doing the Weekend Warrior with a few, you know, extended breaks, especially for my elk hunt. I got lucky as heck in Wyoming and drew that just a late season, really, really good tag. And uh, it's going to be packing in with horses into the heart of grizzly country, but chances at just absolute giant bulls. So I'm going to take a full week off for that one and put the time in because the chances I probably won't draw that tag anytime again soon. Right on. Yeah, we, all of us working class guys, we all have to figure out how much time we can take. And then we have to figure out which hunt we're going to take it on. But that elk hunt sounds like a good one. So Wyoming, man, you guys have some of the best elk hunting uh, in the entire West. Man, you guys can grow some big bulls. So it's kind of tough for us non-residents to get some of those tags or we're not allowed to hunt the wilderness. But man, you guys got some good hunting. So you got your lucky draw this year. How many years you been putting in for that tag? You know, on and off, I've put in for it, but I've just kind of, it's not a unit that I've really ever expected to draw. So sometimes I'll put in for one of the units that's not a late season hunt just to see some new country, but I've never drawn any of them. So this year I have, I actually have some out of state friends from Idaho where I grew up and they drew general tags. So I kind of, I was just planning on hunting a general tag and going back to the same base and I killed my big bull in last year. So I just figured I'd put in for basically the hardest draw in the state. And so of course, when I read the draw results, they're successful next to my name. The one year I really didn't care if I drew or not. (laughs) (laughs) So I guess that's how it works out. So I'm just going to be a pack mule for my buddies now. And you know, it's kind of, it's almost like pressure's off for me. It's weird. It's really weird for me not to have an archery elk tag in my pocket this year. That's kind of just a weird feeling, but at the same time, I get to call for my buddies, and I don't have any pressure on me to be elk hunting in September, so I can focus everything on mule deer, which I'm pretty excited about. Yeah, um, yeah, that'll be a great hunt as well. But it's nice when the pressure's off like that, and you can just enjoy the hunt. Now you can kind of focus on your buddies anyways, and, and it's uh, that's kind of the beauty of that system in Wyoming for you residents, same here in Montana, that – we get our general tag every year, so we're hunting elk every single year. We just put in for these special draw tags, and then you know yeah. we hope to get lucky and draw one of those, you know, and then that is our elk tag for the year. But that late season, man, that is a special experience. Like that's really where I cut my teeth elk hunting. It taught me so much about elk behavior. It's one of the toughest times of year to hunt them you know, after the rut, but once yep. you start to get some weather, it just starts to expose those, those bigger bulls are running in bachelor crews or running solo. The snow keeps them out feeding for quite a while, man. It's a special time of year. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, I got to do a little bit of the migration stuff when I was guiding up on the park line out of the Jackson side. And there was only really one year in the five years I guided up in the wilderness there that I truly saw migration because we just finally got a ton of snow when there was still hunting season was open. And, it this I know the migration I saw up here is pretty mini minuscule compared to what the Cody side does, but it uh it was a cool experience. I had a client with me and just we 
we saw elk piling into the border for days and they we were waiting for them to cross and then one day we rode up and it was just like kind of out of a movie i looked out in this giant meadow where you always dream of elk being but there's never elk and there was seven bulls all like 330 class bulls just sitting out there sparring and fighting and i was like oh this is real life this actually does happen so it's going to be i'm definitely going to be dreaming of a uh, hopefully a lot of snow in late october to push more elk because if we could get a lot of snow i know the hunt that i drew is truly can be a pretty remarkable hunt where you can possibly look at over a hundred bulls in a day. Man. Yeah. Um, absolutely. Like, um, that all makes really good sense what you're talking about. Cause it's the same here in the Madison. So we get to hunt, um, late October through November, all the way to the end of the, the month of November. Yeah. So it's always good rifle hunting. It's just, if you don't have the weather, the bulls really find these these hidey holes to hide in. So they're up in the high country still. They're you know probably at eight to ten thousand feet, and they just find these these timbered holes, and they just feed, and they still have to come out in openings, but they're just little slides. And and see, they find these drainages because these bulls that reach maturity are six, seven, eight years old. And so they find these places where they can hide on public land during a general rifle season. And so that's kind of where they reside. But, man, the minute the weather comes in, like I can – about once every 10 years, we'll really get the storms in November, and the bulls just pile out. You can't believe all the bulls right. on the side hill. Like you say, to see 100 bulls in a day – uh, isn't that unusual or you can see that many in a day and just see the bachelor herds come out and man they they really do some some big harvesting on bulls but i noticed yeah. even those like little storms or little pulses will sure push those elk to their winter range you know like around here even when we get a september snowstorm it seems to kind of push those elk down onto those faces and those places they like um, your migration, are they coming from a farther place? Like you really need a lot of snow and cold in the high country. No, you know, it seems to me like in those, the last years that I guided up kind of in that migration route up North of Jackson. And then I know from the Cody side, it seems to me these elk, even the ones coming way out of Yellowstone, which you're talking 70 plus miles on migration route. But I, I feel like more and more, it's not taking as much snow. They kind of are, you know, they just do it naturally, but the snow definitely helps push them. But I noticed, you know, if you get those early snows in September and October, it'll push groups of them. And then those groups kind of hold up when the snow stops. So it's, you know, we always relied on it where I guided in a general tag area. We relied on hopefully early storms to push some of the elk out of Yellowstone and then it would stop. And we'd hopefully have a new group of elk to hunt. Cause you'd for that first, like, 10 days of rifle season, you'd have really good resident, your resident elk to go after with clients. But after you banged away at them a few times, they disappeared. And there was some times if we didn't get storms, I mean, you could ride that country that looks like it should be filled with elk for days. And there's just nothing there until you kind of get a refresh from a storm cycle. Man, that's exactly it. Those storm cycles push them. And then, like, uh, here, like, it'll push them down to the face in winter rain spots. And, man, if you're hunting the weather, like, even during bow season, you can really get into some epic rut parties, like, that you get that early September snow. Yeah. And it's funny, it just pushes those elk down a little bit, and all of a sudden you're seeing them on all the fringes in the faces and really get a good chase on them. And it was the same thing rifle season, hunting right after a storm it just seems to shuffle the deck a little bit, move those elk. They have to feed a little bit more. And, and then I also notice like when you get that, that weather too, it seems like they have to be uh, more focused on their food stores, stay out a little bit later. You know, they don't, they can't run quite as tight of a program cause they got to get those calories in them. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, I, I live for the, the rut in that early season, just like, you know, you do high country mule deer looking for velvet up on the high peaks. But there's just something about me since the years I, I mean, I got to spend so much time doing late season hunting, which a lot of people can find miserable because it's not necessarily the most pleasant times to be in the mountains. But I had to do it for work for so many years being a guide for nine years that it was I had to do it no matter what. But there's just something about a fresh layer of snow and being on a peak, no matter how cold it is, it just kind of. You know, as daylight breaks, you just you're sitting there because, you know, it's almost like a fresh painting, a fresh landscape, and you just don't know what it's going to show. And I kind of I really I really do enjoy that those late season hunts with snow on the ground. There's just there's just something about it, especially with the thought of big, big Wyoming bulls. Um, I mean, the more I think about it and the more I talk to 
some close friends of mine that have drawn that tag or hunted it before. Uh, my excitement level has risen dramatically here in the past month, realizing kind of the tag I have and just the opportunity for such an awesome hunt that's going to be this fall. Oh, man. Uh, yeah, that's unreal. You get to go hunt them in the best spot. And really, you know, I say that late or that that later season after the rut is the toughest time to hunt a bull. But it's at, you know, it's only the toughest because the the bulls are out of the rut and they run a tighter program. But but once that weather starts to hit, it starts to expose their weaknesses. They have to be out and feed. They have to be out and be seen. And you know, that's where you can capitalize. But man, it's an awesome season. It is kind of miserable, like you say. Um, <laughs> it is cold as all get out. It's tough to get around country. The snow's deep. Like, you just really have to work for it. But within that, like anything, like the harder you work at something, kind of, you know, the the more you're drawn to it or the more you enjoy it. And, yeah, you got to start a fire at about every vantage point you yeah. stop at because you just can't stop and sit still without some warmth. Right. Yeah, and it's uh, – I mean, this country, the, the my kind of my game plan as of right now from the people I've talked to, I'm going to pack in with – if I go solo, I'll, I'll take probably four head of horses so I can pack enough horse feed in for a week as well that I don't have to come back out. But I'll pack in like anywhere from 12 to, I don't know, 18 miles, depending on where I decide to set up camp. Just And I'll be hunting it like anywhere from nine to 11,000 feet, which is kind of a weird feeling for November. But that's where this, this area and these bulls, they just they pile out into this high country and they'll live up there all winter on windswept ridges that the wind just blows clean of snow. And it's it's kind of crazy. I mean, they're it just it's one of those things just how tough elk are i mean they'll live up there all winter long and so i guess from the people i've talked to these elk i mean snow or not they push into that area that time of year and it's just you get to just every day wake up and ride up and you can see new groups of elk that just literally appear out of nowhere and you don't realize where they come from so it's you know it's going to be a new experience and a new hunt and as long as i can kind of fend off the grizzlies that are i know are incredibly thick in the spot it'll that just adds to the excitement, I guess, and I'm comfortable around them, so it doesn't bother me at all. But it will uh, it will keep me a little bit more on my toes in camp at night, obviously, with horses and everything, having the bears around. Yes, um, for sure. I just went into one of my elk spots the other day. I had been doing pretty good. I So bear season, I'm glassing for bears all the time, and I saw 34 black bears for the season, <laughs> zero grizzly. And so I thought, man, that's, I'm that's I'm good doing race. good. Yeah, that's a good average. We got a lot of black bears around. And then I backpacked into this spot for an overnight trip and grabbed a couple vantage points and saw like seven grizzlies in this location. They were just oh, everywhere in there. They're so thick. Uh, but the country looked so good, and the elk hunting looked good in there. But uh, <laughs> there was a heck of a lot of bears. So, um, but but yeah, you know that those at least in November they're starting to kind of den up, even though they right. can have kind of an an ornery attitude. But it yep. seems like that late season that you're hunting, um, I, I don't. They start to put away later November, don't you think, Stephen? Yeah, I think so. You know, from all the time I've dealt with them up in the like hunting country where I was, they were. I mean, once snow was on the ground, they were definitely a lot more active, just like you'd expect from an elk or a deer. But they do start disappearing, and you start to probably lose numbers. But it seems like maybe those bigger ones or the obviously the hungrier ones will stay out. And those are the ones that kind of scare you are those ones that didn't get enough food during the fall, and they're kind of looking for that last protein source. So it's a – it's. I mean, it'll be a, a good time of year because tracks will be on the ground. You know, I can kind of keep an eye on what's going around my camp at night. and But at the same time, it – makes you be, have to be really cautious because the bears you're running into are probably hungry and they're probably looking for a food source. So you just got to definitely play it by ear and keep your head on a swivel. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and you'll have your rifle in there, which you always feel a little bit safer with a rifle just because but, it's such an accurate weapon. Yeah, I'll probably be doing the whole rifle, pistol, and bear spray <laughs> back just to – I'll have a little bit of everything, whether it's in the – one's in my saddlebag, one's on my chest, you know, one's in the scabbard, but – I'll definitely be going more prepared than I need to be in, especially just for the area and that I know how active the Grizzlies can be in that area. Yeah, that's the way to go. Man, you are going deep in the wilderness. That is going to be an experience. It's going to be like hunting elk on Everest. Yeah, it'll be a, it, it'll be fun. It's just it's big country. I know that. It's just big, big, long ridges, and they're pretty open. It was a lot of burn in that country, so it's I'll be putting in a lot of time on the glass, I think, but – you know, from everyone I talk to that just gets, you know, my excitement up, they just say, you're not going to ride around and not see elk. You're just going to have to be picky and not shoot the first thing you see, just kind of put a level out there. So I'm kind of, 
I being that it is a tough draw tag, I'm I'm going to set myself to a level of kind of bettering my bull from last year is going to be my baseline. And then I'm going to play it by ear. Just if there's a ton of elk in the area, I might just sit there and kind of hold out and get a lay for the land and see what's around. And, you know, it's kind of weird for me to be sitting there holding out for a certain type because I've never been just a, a, you know, a trophy tag draw hunter. I've always just been lucky or hopeful to get a big bull. But now that I have a tag that the possibility is really there, I'm going to have to be a little bit picky on riding past 330 to 350 class bulls, hopefully, which is not a bad problem to have. No, what a great <laughs> opportunity. Uh, what'd your bull end up going last year, 355 or something or 360? Three- yeah, 361 gross. Wow, what a bull. Man, yeah, anytime they start going that big, they just look like giants. Um, you know, he grew on me like 20 or 30 inches as I walked up on him. I I really, when I first saw him at daylight, I just knew he was a solid six point. I got a really quick glimpse of his horns over a cliff from when I seen him. And I just, I knew right then there was no question he was a bull I was going to take. But after I shot him, he disappeared. I really didn't get that much time to admire him or look at him when I was still hunting and looking for my shot he was basically right above a cliff band so all i could see were the tops of his horns so i only had one spot where he stepped into an opening so i never really could judge him so as i walked up on him and his beams just kept getting longer and everything bigger i was like oh this is a lot bigger bull than i thought it was so it was a pleasant surprise <laughs> a dang giant man <laughs> yeah I was, I was pumped that's for sure oh what a great one so um yeah and what a great opportunity for you you've been hunting elk for so many years and you've harvested so many of them and then harvested good bulls so a guy like you, you really know what you're looking for and what you're looking at. Like sometimes that can be the biggest challenge is just having enough elk experience in the woods to really know what a good bull is. Because, man, you see a 320 bull on the head, it looks like a giant bull. You'd swear it was 360 the first one you ever saw. You know, they look really big on top of their head. And so elk can be a little tough to judge because, you know, like you say, the difference between – um you know, a 320 bull and a 350 bull may just be a couple inches on each time, you know? Yeah, I agree. And, you know, I, cr- I have to credit a lot of, like, m- just my comfortable comfort with it is from, you know, I got lucky to spend nine years guiding elk, and none of those, most of those weren't my tags, but it, it just enabled me to every single day try and look at elk and always judge them, always putting tapes to racks when clients put animals on the ground. And that helped me a lot with realizing, you know, that difference between the 320, the 300 level, the 350 level. And it's a, I'm definitely no expert at it, but I feel comfortable in judging them. But I don't know about that, that next echelon, I guess, you know, that 370, 380 and above, they just look giant. So that's kind of what I'm hoping to go into this hunt and see is just one of those ones that like, there's no question in my mind. I'm not sitting there wondering what his score is. Just they're going to have that factor that I'm going to know it's the bull I want to put a tag on. You're absolutely right. You're going to see it. and It's going to be an absolute giant. The one you want to go for that you do anything to kill, you know, which you're probably going to have to being up in that high country. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, so so bulls can be tricky. Like I think with any animal, experience is just the best teacher. Just like you talked about guiding, and you can somebody can tell you, and that definitely shortens the learning curve to give you little secrets like muleys. You know, use the air the ear width to you know is yep. usually around twenty two inches. I've seen it as big as twenty five, twenty six. I've seen it as small as eighteen, twenty. But it kind of gives you a guideline. But when I start hunting new species, like when the guys tell me how to judge axis you know it takes me a long time of hunting those things and seeing a lot of them before i can actually tell what a 30 inch buck looks like it just takes experience and same thing you know show up and um goats are notoriously notoriously tough to judge and we're going to get into that next because you've got another good tag but (laughs) hunting these these himalayan tar it was the same thing the difference between a big one and a decent one is two inches you know a a 10 incher to a 12 incher 11 incher to a 13 incher and you start looking at them and it It just takes – you just have to see a bunch of them and look at them and kind of figure out what big is. But I really think experience is the best teacher. Do you have any tricks you use on bulls or is it just your experience over the years of seeing frame size, tine length, and then you can kind of tell? Yeah, you know, like I mean definitely just experience. And I mean an old friend of mine that uh, I used to teach a guide school for him up in Montana and everything, we kind of always taught students baselines for everything. But – um it just he always said you know with bulls you're just I always looked at the brow tines kind of on a mature bull a mature six point and if they extended out to the nose 
you know, you're kind of looking at that 16 inch range. And then if they start curling up, you know, you're looking in that tw push in the twenties. And I always kind of use that as a judge for on, you know, those bulls that are in that like 320 ish range where you're really trying to realize, is that a 320 bull or is that a 310 or a 300? Because when you really look at those lower brow, brow tines, sometimes you see they only come out and they come halfway down the snout. And it kind of gives you a judge that's about, you know, 14, 15 inch brow tine. And it's probably not that bigger quality of bull. And kind of, I use that to judge all the way up, but man, that's a great yeah. trick, Steven. I like that because the brow tines are such a good tell on bulls and you've got the nose to measure by and you're right. That can be the difference maker of a bull going 340 or going 310 is all right. in the brow tines. And when you can look at them and see that they're only 12 inches long or see if they're 20 and for a bull to be a 400 inch bull, he's just got to have 20 inch <laughs> tine, six point all the way up. Yeah, exactly. You know, that's, so that's of course what I'm hoping for. Obviously. Yeah, right. Me too. <laughs> Too, one of these years so yeah. that's a great tip is to look at the brow tines and i have to say i'm guilty of not looking at the brow tines i always look at the tops oh i do too i mean I, you, the, the whale tails <laughs> kind of sucks everybody and i think and that's i think that when i used to you know have trouble judging when i was beginning was if you looked at the top of a bull and it looked like a good whale tail but you really don't you kind of forget to take in the fact the mass of the horns all the way down and then you realize the bull after, you know, we harvested him or something. If I would have looked at the brow tines and realized he was a bit younger of a bull, I would have known his mass really wasn't as heavy as I thought it was. And just all that plays into the score of what you're looking at at the, you know, the top end, but in all, you know, like you would know, bulls are different. You know, you can have a bull with a terrible lower end and a giant top end. And those ones are hard to judge, but when it comes to just a good solid typical, I think, I always like to try and remember to look at the brows to kind of give me a, a rough judge of what the bull's carrying all the way up. Yeah, no, I think that's a great trick. I need to do more of that. I, I'm like you where I've just looked at so many and so many winter range bulls and been on so many harvests and picked up yeah. and measured so many sheds that, that I, I almost know exactly what I'm looking at every time I see it. But not that I'm to the inch, but within 10 inches or so, you know, I'm usually pretty close. Right. But I, I like to look for frame, too. It seems like I can look at the frame of a 300-inch bull or a frame of a 330-inch bull or a frame of a 350-inch bull you know like yep. once they start to get 50 inch main beams and once they start to get a 40 45 inch spread like right. it's just a good looking bull but you're right is there's so much that goes into a score of a bull and he can have giant tops and then small fronts or he can have huge fronts <laughs> and small tops heck you know he could be a five point still make 320 with really yep. good fronts big whale tail 55 inch beams or whatever the case is and so everyone's unique that's kind of the fun of it and you got to just look at a bunch of them measure a bunch of them look at dead elk um i really like your your tip of the brow tines another good one is the thirds the thirds are gonna yeah. give you inches or take away from them and little tiny thirds it's tough i mean i i met a guy last year that killed a a giant bull with little tiny thirds that went i think like close to 370 or so it was a giant bull but usually the thirds are a pretty good tell of what level that bull is. It's not the first thing I look at. I look at the frame. I look at the top end, look at time length, but that third is going to tell you, you know, a lot of times it'll tell you whether it's a 320 or a 350. Yeah. I, I mean, the thirds is a big thing. I always look at them because I mean, I grew up in Idaho where it was just notorious to have terrible thirds. And it, I don't know what, if it's something that's always bugged me about a bull that has just weak little thirds but that was one thing i noticed when i saw this bull i saw one his left side horn and the first thing i noticed like kind of in the hazy daylight through my spot and scope was he just had solid points all the way up he had what uh, looked like a solid six but i could tell his third was as long as his second if not you know in that category it kind of it scooped down and then came way up and ivory tipped and i mean it was just immediate right there i knew he was a 340 or above bull kind of type deal exactly same thing you say though for like people that haven't got the opportunity to put hands on elk and stuff it's hard to judge you can sit there and look at pictures all day long but a picture of a 340 bull and an actual one sitting there at 300 yards is a big difference and I, you know, when I was younger and got into guiding or when I was younger growing up, every chance I got to put my hands on a, someone else's elk or sheds or anything, I put tapes to sheds all the time, whether they were big or small, and just to help me with learning how to measure and everything. But I think nowadays, you know, it's just, it's second nature to me to look at a bull and 
I just feel confident that I know within 10 inches what he is usually because I've just looked and put my hands on so many through the years. Yeah, that's that's me too. Yeah, exactly. I love those thirds that um, come outside the rack, the big yep. ones that come outside that make them even wider. And then, um, yeah, I'd say my fair, favorite characteristic on a bull is is the whale tail, but that four or five combo, you know, where that four is sword tine is 20 yep. to 24 inches. And then I love that fifth tine where it's really long, where he goes, you know, 12, 14, 16 inches, like almost parallels that fourth tine or that sword tine. Yeah, those are just amazing looking bowls. Oh, I love those big top end bowls like that. I had a, I mean, it's, I have a pretty good like picture comparison just in my head right now of like bulls that would, you know, for a new elk hunter would probably would trip them up real quick. I mean, last year when I was archery hunting in an area, I went in after a bull into just a nasty hell hole and I ended up finding a deadhead that had definitely been there for a year or two. And he has, if you, I took a picture of him and sent it to a few friends, you know, as I was working my way out of the Canyon and, you know, I started getting texts back 350, 360, gotta be 340 at least. And uh, I was laughing the whole time because the picture made it look that big. If you'd look at that bull, you know, on the hoof, you'd realize first and foremost, he had really short main beams and then his brows were quite a bit smaller. So the points weren't as long as they appeared and you can make him look in a picture and his, but his fourth and his fifth were both almost equal height. So he looked huge. If you just looked at the top end, but he was only a 290 bull when I put a tape to him. <laughs> uh, it's amazing how big of a bull it takes to make a 300 bull when you actually like you do when you put tapes to all the bulls you kill and sometimes it's gonna disappoint you you're gonna kill a bull <laughs> that you know my buddy robin killed a giant a couple years ago and um it was so heavy and so much mass and i started comparing it to a lot of the bulls around my house and it stood up to a lot of the 330 bulls i have hanging on my wall and we scored that bull and he was 310 you know he just didn't have a big top end he had the brass he had a good third just his top end was a little weak you know but yeah it's it's amazing what it takes to make a 300 inch bull or it's amazing what it takes to make a 320 or like in your case a 361 it, they're just yeah. giant and they carry their mass through all their tines when they go you know 361 or whatever it's it's not it's weird because it's a, a big looking six point but it's just like it's almost more massive everywhere, and so you can't really tell that it's just longer everywhere, too. It's longer and more massive and really carries that mass out those tines, it seems like. I'm sure that's what your bull looked like, right? Yeah, you know, my bull didn't have, you know, if I if I really want to be nitpicky on my bull of why he could have been bigger or what, he, you know, his, his royals really aren't that big. If I remember offhand, he's only like 17 on his royals or maybe 18, and then his fifths were, you know, around 12, 13, but he had a 57-inch main beam and a 55-inch main beam, which was huge. Wow. And then his thirds were 16 or so, His and then his fronts were all both all right at kind of that 20. And then, yeah, he, like you say, he just carried his mass le- – all the way out to the tips, you know, I, I lost very little mass measurements from the G1 through the G4. Man, what so, a bull. But yeah, you know, I, I sat there, I was like, well, it, you know, later on, you know, months later as I'm sitting there looking at my wall, I'm like, man, it'd been cool if he had 24 inch Royals and just <laughs> sitting there, you know, daydreaming about, oh, that would have made him 380. And that's, that kind of also gives you in your mind that idea of that's that next echelon, you know, that, you know, that's the kind of, when you're looking at that next group of bulls into that you know ultra category how they do it is i mean they just have the length everywhere they're not missing anything yeah absolutely um yeah uh it's so funny like we talk about you know as i mentioned big frames and bulls it like brings me back to this this rifle bull i killed like with my dad and it was quite a few years ago it was hunting late season like you're going to be doing november and uh, when I first started hunting, I was just really into chasing big bulls. And I didn't matter if it was with my bow or with my rifle, but I'd set my standards for the year. And so I was hunting this great big bull. Um, the bull actually ended up getting killed. Um, and he went – so uh, spoiler alert, I didn't get the bull. But I think he went like 365 or 367. Maybe he's maybe he was 356, but somewhere just a giant, you know. And so I was watching this bull, and he was running with seven other bulls. And the weather hadn't really come in yet, and so these bulls were on such a tight program. Like, they they wouldn't come down and out of the timber to come feeding until after it was already dark. And then, you know, same thing in the morning. I'd set up on them, so I caught them one night coming out. 
coming out onto the face just at last light. So I started hunting them. I hunted them for seven days in a row, and they just cross in the dark every day. And I could hear them moving through the snow, and I'd cut their tracks, and I, I just couldn't ever catch up to them. And finally one morning, I had my dad out there, and we got out there, and um, five bulls came up. So we were missing two of the bulls. One of the bulls was the great big big one, the 350 right. or 360 or whatever. But um, in this group, there was just some giants. So my dad ended up knocking down the first six point, and um, he didn't look as big. He didn't have as big a frame, but he had really good times, and the bull ended up going – um, 334, he was just a great one all the way up. And dad knocked that one down. Um, and then I took the one with the big frame and I killed a bull with, um, he had 59 inch main beam and a 60 inch main beam on the other wow. side. He, um, uh, he only went 311. So again, that's to my case. <laughs> it just takes a lot for a bull to go big. Now this, this bull had like 12 inch tines all the way up, but just giant main beams. Like I wonder what that bull would have gone in the end, but we ended right. up harvesting two bulls out of the group, but it took me seven days to catch up to those bulls in that late season. It was just yeah. a wild hunt for them. It's crazy. Just some of the patterns you got to get into, you know, what, with my bull, what I learned in that air, in that basin is, and which is why I think it's a, a basin that just holds big bulls. It's two years in a row. I've seen a big, big bull in this general tag, pretty heavily hunted area basin. Cause I think it gets overlooked because these bulls literally don't do anything in the daytime and they go into the timber within, I mean, it's almost seemed like minutes after daylight would hit. And I just, I mean, I was lucky enough. I was right there above my camp and he stayed out a little longer and gave me, and they were heading straight into the timber. And I'd been up in there the weekend before when it was the last week in archery. And I chased a whole different group of elk at the head of the basin down into the timber. And they were in there all day rutting. But I kind of felt like if anyone else was getting up into this area, unless you were in there before dark, you had no idea that there was this many elk in there and it kind of, you know, made it a little honey hole for me and it worked out, but it's the same thing of just finding the pattern of the, especially these bigger bulls. But when they live in the timber, it sure is hard. Well, yeah. And, um, you know, especially like here or where you shot your bull, which is really the biggest feather in your cap is, you know, it's a general for you residents, you know, it's yeah. anybody can go in there. Same thing here with Montana. They give 19,000 non-resident tags and, um, every resident can hunt it. These general season bulls, man, they just get slick. Like even in the late season, they know there's a late general season rifle tag here or rifle season here. And so right. these bulls, man, they just tighten up their programs. And so it does take that weather to expose them or it's just, um, it's being on those vantage points. Now you, like you had your bow season knowledge, which came, um, into play where you knew those bulls were hanging in there, but it yep. was also like getting to those vantage points and just really sitting there till last light or making sure that you're there at first light those master vantage points they show you where the elk are don't they yeah you know and i i think that's you know people everyone can like kind of preaches the whole first light idea or last light but i mean i harp on it more than anything it truly the difference between the first 15 minutes of light and the last 15 minutes if you just want to get back to your camp kind of in the dark because you don't want to hike in the dark or anything what you can miss coming out of a stretch of even a tiny little thing of timber you've been looking at all day. I've sat there on a high point and looked all day long and not seen a dang thing or seen nothing that I was interested in. And then sat there until dark and there, you know, 15 minutes before dark, whether it's elk or especially, I feel like it happens with high country mule deer all of a sudden out of a tiny strip of timber that you feel like you've glassed every leaf and pine needle in comes an absolute toad of a buck or, you know, a big bull comes out of. And yeah, I think those first 15 and last 15 are a hundred percent worth being where you want to be and where you want to see, not hiking in or hiking out. I, I feel like there's a lot of people that just don't realize the importance of those minutes of being where you need to be, not on the way to where you need to be. Yeah. And, and you're right. As it's common knowledge, it's everybody's read it, everybody's heard it, but to live by it and to practice it day in, day out, that's how you kill big bulls and big bucks. It really is just believing in it and sitting on that vantage. And I know multiple times, you know, late season elk, like you're talking or even deer season, like I can remember elk season, you know, being sitting on a, a bachelor group of 10 bulls. And I saw where they put away that morning and then watching four or five guys come walking by, you know, that are hunting ridge lines or hunting back there that have no idea those elk are even in there. And, you know, here I am setting up for evening to try to kill one of these things. And these guys are just walking around and then they'll they'll tell you that they haven't seen any elk or, you know, there hasn't been any around or haven't ran yep. into any tracks. And it's like, 
man, you really have to live and die behind your glass and be in there at the right times. You could be in the best spot, the best elk hunting spot on planet Earth, but if you're not there at the right time, you're not going to see what's living in there. You could go in there and see zero elk, hike out of there and go, no, that drainage was no good. But it really is sitting there to that first and last light. And then that late season is in any season for elk. Elk are so nomadic that you just have to grind. Like your job is to locate a bull and you just got to go up one drainage and, and look up there, grab good vantage points. If they're not there, you got to move to the next drainage. Or, you know, like in your case where you have some winter range, you have some elk definitely moving around where right. it's got, it can be different elk every day. And uh, I did have a spot like that I used to hunt. It was way back in Tom Miner Basin, like um, back when the, yep. the northern greater Yellowstone herd was 20,000 plus. But yep. you'd sit on that vantage point. You could see that whole drainage. And uh, it'd be it'd be late season elk hunting. It was, it was some great elk hunting. God, there were some big bulls that came out of the park. <laughs> and you'd sit there on the vantage point, and you'd see a bull, and you'd go for him, you know, and try to get over there and get to him. And maybe it wouldn't happen, and you'd hike all the way back to the vantage point and sit back down again and look over there, and here'd be another bull coming out of the meadow. You'd have to do like a, a two-a-day to get back at him, you know. Right. But they were just newer bulls showing up where it was a real migration hunt where every day was different – Every morning and night was different from the vantage point. But, yeah, just discipline behind your glass, as you know. Yeah, you know, live and die by the glass. And you know, I think as high country mule deer hunters, we you learn that lesson very quickly. Otherwise, you'll kill yourself trying to put your legs to find the deer instead of the eyes. But, you know, I have I definitely see, like, on Internet forums and things like that, people asking, well, why should I bring a spotting scope if I'm going on an elk hunt? And, man, I, my spotting scope is just as much a part of my pack as any other major piece of gear and you know i might pick up a smaller spotting scope for like an elk an elk hunt where i'm not i don't need to you know really pick details out like i do on long distance on deer but i i have no desire to go into country without a spotting scope it has saved me more times than not even when it comes to elk because when you get elk out there a couple miles it can get hard to tell oh is that a good bull or a decent bull or i mean if the light's bad and hazy and you're sitting there on your binos, sometimes it's even hard to tell if it's a bull depending on the background. So I, I mean, I, my spotter is with me no matter what species I'm hunting. That's just, I mean, that's not even a question in my mind, no matter how much it weighs or what it adds to my gear. Yeah. Um, I go back and forth on hunting elk, but yeah, I'm with you. A mule deer, I cannot go anywhere without my scope. And when I used to hunt, um, late season bulls with my rifle is right. same way. I, I never go anywhere without right my scope. Season, it's with me archery. You know, I'm usually in the timber and stuff. I don't have the scope with me, I guess in archery, I could care. You know, I definitely don't carry it as much, but when it's that late season or just after they've been pushed and rutted and that, you know, those bigger bulls are holed up and you might be sitting on a high point for a long time, it's always with me. Mm -hmm. I've, I've been trying out one of those smaller scopes here. Um, man, those things, they sure are nice uh, for weight in your pack and being able to uh, uh, have a scope with you. So definitely going to be in my pack for elk season. <laughs> and I'm with you, man. You, they get a couple miles away. You just can't really tell what they are. Like You can tell frame size and elk are a little bit easier with the binos, but right. when they get out there, you just can't tell what they really are. So yeah, you could be going and covering miles to go get over there. It's not even really a bull that you're looking for. Right, which I have done in the past. So <laughs> I've learned to save my body and my legs, you know, as I get older with the, using the gl glass religiously. And yeah, I've a, uh, I'm, I'm strongly considering picking up one of these, these newer kind of really high profile, awesome, lightweight spotters that are holding their own in the glass category against some of the bigger models. Yeah, no, I think that'd be a perfect fit for you. Um, but yeah, what an awesome elk tag! What an awesome opportunity! And, uh, yeah, so we keep uh, mentioning high country mule, mule deer. Um, you're such a muley guy like me. You just can't help yourself. Um, you love hunting those things, don't you? Yeah. I mean, just, man, I live in just the mecca for it out here, and I'm, you know, eating it all up as I'm here. And it's, for me, it's, I mean, I almost, I don't know if, uh, I mean, I love hunting them, but, man, the scouting is just as much enjoyment of as hunting, just being out, getting, or, you know, a reason to, go check out new mountain ranges every weekend and new peaks that I've never been and just not knowing what you're going to see, but knowing you're going to turn up deer and just the thought of possibly turning up a giant every weekend is, you know, and especially in the velvet, it's so much fun to be up in these high basins on the weekends, just away from the hustle and bustle of town and looking for big bucks. 
Good for you. I'm with you. I, I'm in love with the process, too. I love scouting, um, I, but I've got to work sometime. In the summertime, it's usually my yeah. time to get yeah. in work, but I try to get in as many scouting trips as I can. I know that uh, for your big buck that one year, you had like 10 scouting trips or something like that. Yeah, I watched him for it. I mean, it was close to two months by the time I harvested him. And then I, I, had, I had scouted numerous other decent bucks. And I actually, so last year, the a little bit before, a couple weekends before I found him, I found two really solid bucks. One was, I was kind of guessing about 190-ish typical, just a really tall, good frame buck. And the other one was a younger deer without, because of his mass, I could tell. And he just kind of had a smaller frame, but he had incredibly deep forks and inlines. And he was just a gorgeous buck that I figured would go in the 180s, and he was just young. But uh, I made the decision. I sat there kind of on the last day I was up in that area. I was like, well, I mean, I'd be happy as heck with either one of those bucks. But if one of those bucks got another year on them, what, kind, what could they be? Because they're both young. And uh, so that's kind of what made the decision for me to go check out this other area that I eventually found the buck I harvested last year. So uh, one of the number one spots I'll be going in August is back to the basin where those two bucks were living and uh, really hoping to turn up one of them again. Oh, how cool. Yeah, um, I'm with you. I just love that scouting season. I love looking for next level bucks and you see so many good numbers that time of year. And, you know, earlier in the season, they have their red coats on and, and it is really a true lax summer attitude. It's not even like the bow season. They're just out in the wide open. They're out in the basins and, yep. and you can count a hundred bucks in a day in the right locations. And sometimes you're looking for more remote drainages where you get in there and there may only be one back bachelor crew of bucks in there but gosh is that the time of year to really turn up a good buck to then and then you know that buck is in there and alive and you can really try to target like that next level buck the key to killing a next level buck is finding the next level buck yeah exactly and you know it's it's been kind of cool you know getting in a routine out here since i got out of guiding and like finding a buck and passing on them like i did these ones last year in the hopes of going back there to see them the next year and kind of once you get to know these areas or if you find bucks that you want to let live because you know i i say i'm not a trophy hunter but i do push myself to harvest mature animals i guess and i just don't if i don't need the meat i'm not going to har- just shoot a small four point deer just to say i shot a deer this year i'd rather eat my tag if as long as i can get through the rest of the year on elk meat or whatever because i like to see these bucks grow to maturity, especially with the mule deer herd, always kind of seemingly to be in decline. And we've had some rough winters. So it's, uh, for me, I kind of just push myself to try and find those higher level bucks because it's, it's a challenge and it makes me push myself to new areas. And I just, I have a serious problem with uh, being satisfied with like one area. I mean, I have basins that I've scouted for years that I know I could go to this year and they'll, they'll hold a solid buck, but I always have that desire to go see what's over the next ridge or what's you know, the next peak that I've never stepped foot on. I just always have that desire to go see something new. So I'm, I'm pretty hard pressed to scout the same areas year after year. I mean, I'll, there's a couple I'll check out, but I always love to go check out a lot of new country. I'm the same way. Like I keep those spots in the back of my head, but I'm always looking for new. I don't know why that is, but yeah, I've got, um, I don't have quite as many days in the unit I'm hunting this year. Like I've got way more in, in G probably 40 days in there, but I probably got like, 20 days with all my scouting days and hunting, you know, in that unit. And, and within that, like, you know, three really good locations, not just three drainages, but three ridgelines that connect 20 drainages or whatever that I could go to. But I'm just like you where I'm, um, I'm not going to any of those spots to scout. I've got a totally new spot that I've never (laughs) been that I want to go scout. I just can't help myself. I love to explore. And it seems like once you get yourself familiar with those spots, then you can go back to them. You know where to camp, where to look from, where to look in. And so once it's season, if I need a backup plan, I'm definitely going to one of those spots I know. And I might end up in one of those spots anyways. But uh, for scouting, I'm definitely going to go look at one of these new areas. But I also get like a ton of benefit from, you know, just like you said, like being out of the hustle and bustle and being in the mountains. I mean, that you can kill a bunch of giant bucks. Like that's not what's going to make you happy. What makes you happy is enjoying the process of doing it. The process of trying to find one, the excitement every year. And, and I know that those scouting trips, they make me so much 
more comfortable with sleeping in the high peaks. Like they get me comfortable with putting on extreme miles with a backpack, with yep. camping on knife blade ridge lines, with you know, you know, trying to beat the lightning storms and make sure I'm down and just weather and just like that's the whole reason I love to hunt. And so those scouting trips. Like they're really like training grounds to get me back in sync with the woods again. You know, it's been a, a year since I've been hunting or six months since I've been on any of these high mountain deals. And so like I use those scouting trips as much to get comfortable with being in the mountains and comfortable with my gear, being by myself. And those scouting trips, I really feel like I'm hunting. The only thing you're not doing is stalking and putting an yep. arrow into them or shooting them. But you're you're doing it the exact same way. You're covering a bunch of miles and you're looking for a next level buck. It's just so fun to me. I I enjoy it like you enjoy it. Yeah, you know, and like on top, of, I agree with all those things. And it's the nice thing. I feel like I'm just so much more relaxed on the scouting trips because the pressure is not there to pull the trigger or make the right move. The only pressure for you to there is do whatever the heck you want and keep trying to find big bucks. And you know, I. I think similar to you, I like to just continually cover country and, you know, you hate leaving a basin thinking that, oh, I'm a, you know, maybe I didn't see everything that's here, but at the same time, you kind of, to find that next level buck, you really do just got to hammer out country and put your eyes into a bunch of different places. And I mean, there's definitely a large portion of it where it's just absolute shit luck that you find one. And then, but it comes into, you know, how much effort you're willing to put in, you know, someone, you know, someone might get a tag and go up and just go into somewhere they've never been and randomly ran into a huge deer. That's always a possibility and happens every year. But for me, I just feel like as long as I'm putting in the effort, no matter what I find, I'll be, you know, happy with the outcome at the end of the year as long as I know I put forth the effort that I know I can. Oh, yeah, that that's absolutely me. If I eat a tag but I gave it everything I have, then I feel okay about it. You know, it's when I yeah. quit earlier, I didn't give it all my effort or didn't give it all the time I had. Um, you know, that that's where it's going to burn me for the next year. Um, exactly. Yeah, and it, it's just, uh, like you say, covering country in there, you get to a drainage, and you'd almost like to sit there all day and see every deer in there. But you almost got to keep moving because you got six more drainages to look at. And it's like, well, all right, well, maybe I'll come back and I'll look at it tomorrow morning if it was the best drainage I saw. But, yeah, I, I think a lot of times I'm just covering country. Uh, it sure gets your legs ready for season, doesn't it? Because you're just making all those climbs and big miles. Yep. I love it for that. Yeah, me, I mean, that's, I kind of shoot for every year. My The reason I push myself to scout so hard is just to get my everything ready for the the actual the heavy – the heavy aspects of hunting season and packing out a entire buck or a camp on your backs out of the high country. And, you know, I'm a pretty religious weight room gym person year round. I usually am in the gym at 5 a.m. this time of year before work and then I'll work and then I go try and hit the hills in the afternoon, put on some elevation with just without a pack. And then uh, last night was kind of my first honest, you know, besides bear season, my first good hike with a pack on like a 25 pound pack with my scope and stuff just up into some high country to check out the snow levels and it immediately reminds you once you put the pack on your back that it's a whole you know it's a different game and where you're at kind of level wise but I uh I really like getting the scouting season and kind of just getting my legs back under me and out of the you know out of the kind of the weight room aspect and just getting my cardio back up and I know where I want to be by September 1st I you know I just want to be happy when I'm climbing 3000 feet to go after something I saw, not miserable and just hating life trying to get there. It's so true. Uh, you enjoy it so much more when you're in good shape than when you're in bad shape. You, you can yeah. just enjoy the whole experience. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm the same as you as you know, I, I don't do as much weight training, but a lot of pull-ups, kettlebells, like I'm really disciplined and get that in day in, day out. And then my trail running, I love, and I can just get, you know, the exertion of a three hour hike. I can get it within an hour, half hour and get elevation. So it works really well for me, but all that being said, nothing compares to the mountains. Like the only thing that trains you for mountains is mountains. Like, uh, and, and like you say, you put that 25 pound pack on, I can run all the trail miles I want, but if my back's not used to carrying a backpack, then I'm going to have issues, you know? Yeah. So yeah, it's a mix for me. The running does a lot of great things for me and it gives me discipline. It's day in, day out. I can get in that workout. 
But uh, if I'm being completely honest, nothing gets me ready for the mountains like climbing up in there and scouting, like doing 3,000 elevation in a day and doing a 12-mile day all with a 30-pound pack or 25-pound pack. Like just that pack work and mountain work like that, it, it just gets you whipped into shape. It, it's just yeah. – I think it's almost mandatory before season or otherwise you're in pain during season trying to get in shape while you're hunting. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, I – one thing I've kind of notoriously have noticed I do, and it's not necessarily I mean to do it. I just, when I go on my scouting trips, I, I definitely pack quite a bit heavier, you know, necessarily than I could be. I could be going bare bones a lot lighter a lot of times, but I kind of just look at it as continually preparing myself for hunting season. I mean, I'm carrying just as much weight, if not, you know, less than I would on a hunt, but it just doesn't, I try not to let it bother me because I just need to be ready. So when September gets here and I put those extra five, 10, 15 pounds into a pack for a longer hunt, I've already been carrying a heavy pack than I, you know, heavier pack than I needed to on the scout. So it just doesn't seem as big of a jump in gap, you know, when you go to pack in with that heavier load. Oh, that's smart. Yeah. I'm always going light trying to cover miles, but <laughs> I'm sure I've got my camera in there and my scope and it yeah. always ends up heavier than I want. But, right. um, but yeah, that it, it seems like the the couple things that'll surprise you on a mountain hunt, whether you're hunting elk or whether you're hunting mule deer, even with the day pack, is once you put that pack on your back, it's a different world. Like I can do anything without a pack. I mean, like trail around, like I can run to the top of the Sphinx here with no weight on my back. But the minute you stick weight on, all of a sudden it's a grueling climb. You know that weight is such an equalizer. The weight and also elevation. Like you can have your body ready for miles. But what you really want is you want your body ready to climb. You want your body ready to climb a thousand feet like it's nothing, two thousand feet like it's nothing, three thousand feet in a day, and you're not sore the next day. You know, so I really think that the pack work and the the elevation is just so key to being in shape for the mountains. Yeah, I agree. You know, it kind of it cracks me up sometimes. You you know see a lot with the whole you know the social media hunting aspect at, and everything. People putting up you know, went and packed in 12 miles or 15 miles. It's like the miles is what's, you know, an impressive amount, you know, incredible amount. I could care less if I pack in one mile or if I pack in five, because it's it, sometimes one mile where I go will take six, you know, not probably not six hours, but it can. There's one spot that I used to hunt for deer. It probably from the trailhead to the top of the peak as the crow flies crow flies is right at about a mile and it's a seven hour hike in when i'm in good shape <laughs> it's a miserable miserable hell hole i've said i'm never gonna hunt again and i've hunted of course twice but <laughs> i mean it's just so you know people put how many miles they've covered and stuff it you know for me miles isn't a badge of honor or glory it just it all depends on the terrain you're in and so when people ask me about coming out to you know this country of wyoming and you know well i'm gonna pack in this far i'm, I'm in great shape i'm like these mountains are going to beat you up no matter how great a shape you're in. They beat me up, and I can I live here and consider myself in good shape for these mountains, and they'll beat me up year after year. But I don't look at anything by miles or how far I need to get off the road. I just look at it you know, as destinations and where I need to get to. I don't really worry about what the mileage tells me to get to those places. <laughs> Dude, you are so right. You're spot on. Everybody wants to talk miles and big miles. Like, miles mean nothing to me. Like, I can run, you know, I've ran so many marathons, I can't count. I can run a marathon in three hours. But, you know, the other day, I did, uh, you know, I did this this uh, run where I did like probably 12 to 15 miles or something like that in the mountains, I was running for six hours. That's double the exertion <laughs> it takes me to do a marathon. Like the miles don't make the difference. It's the elevation. And yep. two, GPS looks at the world as a flat map. So exactly. it looks like it, it takes a mountain and it looks at it like a flat mile by mile. But there may be three, four, five miles of topography in that one mile. A GPS does not count that. A GPS does not count walking up angles. Like, that's never made sense. Like, your miles in the mountains, they just don't add up. It's not like walking the flats. It's not like running a half marathon. It's not like running a 10K. It's just different. Like you say, you look at it as destinations, and I'm with you. Like, some of the toughest places I go into that are six, seven-hour hikes, like, I'm only going four miles or three miles on a <laughs> GPS. It's just all uphill. It's all topography. It's all grinding. So, uh 
you're spot on on that. It isn't about the miles putting yourself back in country. Um, it, it's uh, the elevation, the topography, and and sometimes it's just the fight through underbrush or downfall yeah. timber. It, you're going a mile an hour, if that, through some of that stuff. But the exertion level, you're doing yoga poses all the way through that <laughs> that uh, downfall timber to try to get through it. You know. Yeah, you know that's you know that's one of the things that Google Earth doesn't show you know especially people that don't get to live out west or even the many of us that do that go hunt new areas to us you sit there and pour over Google Earth which Google Earth has definitely you know ruined some you know long time hunting spots of people that, because it shows that it looks like a good hunting spot instead of like a good old topo map like I grew up with and uh, but Google Earth just you can sit there with the line and the navigation draw tool that shows you the up and the down of the terrain but. And you can change all these parameters that I've, you know, I've screwed around with it a little bit. I'm definitely no expert on Google Earth like some people are, but it, it just still does not ever show somebody that has not seen those mountains, you know, right in front of them. It just, it's always different when you get there. Okay. And, and I've, it's kind of what I tell people to prepare for. You know, it's like you can sit there on Google Earth, you think you know what it is. It's gonna be worse the moment you get there. You're gonna realize, oh, this is a lot steeper. This is a lot harder. It just it never is easier, it seems like. You're so right. It always looks so small on Google Earth. I'm always wondered if that's far enough back or, gosh, it really isn't that far back in there. And um, when you get there, the mountains are always so much bigger than you ever saw on Google Earth. Like, I get these plans on Google Earth. Oh, I'm going to hit this ridge line. I'm going to hit these six drainages. I'm going to work out here. Like, I get there, and I end up covering a quarter of the country I wanted to, and I'm exhausted. You know? It it just doesn't – it just can't do it yep. justice as a picture. But when you get there, it is always steeper, tougher to navigate, just bigger mountains, just bigger country. It's always tougher. You're right. The, the better you can prepare yourself for that coming the uh, uh, the better off you're going to be once your hunt gets here yeah i mean i and i can eat my own words on that i mean it's definitely not other people or you know just non-residents to the west that have that happen you know i i had it happen to me basically yesterday i mean i uh <laughs> I've, been, I've been pouring over google earth quite a bit for this other tag i have this yeah, mountain so you tag. yeah you got a mountain goat tag dude congratulations dude. how cool is that opportunity I'm stoked. I mean, I've, you know, I grew up in kind of mountain goat country, the sawtooth of Idaho. So I've always admired mountain goats. And I actually, uh, a family friend of ours who has worked alongside my parents for a long time, kind of his big passion for the 20 some years plus years I've known him is he kind of keeps tabs on all the mountain goats. So I always grew up with him showing me pictures of goats. So goats have always been, you know, pretty just kind of a statutory animal in my mind is just badass. And, uh, but this tag, it's uh, it's just kind of a different, it's a weird feeling to it because it's uh, basically they're trying to exterminate a section of goats out of the Teton range because they're infringing on a native herd of bighorn sheep, and because mountain goats can carry pneumonia, biology rules in the in like the national park and game and fish have basically said we need to get rid of these goats to protect potentially wiping out the bighorns, which the biology aspect is correct but still for me looking at it as i hate the idea of trying to exterminate a amazing species from the type of mountains where i just imagine them living in and uh it's so that's kind of an interesting so they gave out a, a lot more tags you know than most goat hunts that are really limited draw but at the same time they called every single person that put in and said look if you draw the chance of harvest is incredibly low there might not be harvest by hunters but we're going to give these tags out to give you an opportunity and the majority of the reason is because the majority of goats live within the national park where we're not allowed to go inside okay so it's uh it's just going to be a big country trying to find needles in a haystack that step outside that boundary or barely live outside that boundary and last night i just did a you know, a, a pretty good hike and got up to 10,000 feet and just put my spotting scope looking way up the range to see what the snow levels were like, which is still ridiculous. I mean, it looks like it's still winter up in a lot of those places, but uh, also just, I kind of humbled myself because I was looking on Google Earth for the, these past few weeks, just kind of going, well, if I hike up, I can get up that ridge in a night and I could probably go over those two peaks in a day scouting that big basin. And then I looked at him with a scope and I was like, yeah, it would take me all day just to get to the top of that one, I think. <laughs> so, you know, it's like it, I've kind of, you know, been eating my own words when I start to realize it's not the type of country I'm going to be able to cover like I would like to. It's going to be I'm going to have to be pretty picky and choosy on where I can scout and how much country I'm going to be able to do a circle through. 
Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, good for you. Like um, uh, going for a tag like that, um, that is a low harvest percentage just to get the opportunity to hunt goats. Cause it is such yeah. a special opportunity for us hunters. There's just, there's not a lot of them and they live in, in, in just absolutely awesome country. So yeah. Um, good on you taking on the challenge and I'm sure you're going to be able to turn some up in that unit. Uh, you, you're just, um, you're too good at covering miles and you're too good <laughs> behind your glass not to see a handful of goats. I- I don't know if it's good or just stubborn, stubborn as a mule, but yeah, I, uh, you know, last night I, you know, I was planned on just like an easy night, just trying to get high enough to put my glass. And of course I couldn't stop hiking forward because I have a serious problem with turning around when I can still have energy. And I just kept glass and basically until dark. And so I didn't get home till quite a bit later than I had planned for having to get up at five in the morning again, but it, uh, I'm looking forward to it. You know, it's just, it's new country, entirely new to me country and it's going to be, just a new kind of experience. So that's my next two weekends after this weekend will be uh, entirely devoted to kind of two spots I have picked out where I think I might run into goats. And there's kind of one area all the, the biologists have kind of told most of the people is going to be the most good, the best chance that these you might find some goats outside. But I do know from living here of some other spots where I, there is resident goats that live outside the park. They're just a lot smaller in numbers and harder to find. So I kind of like that idea of getting in deep and trying to look for these maybe remote spots where I know goats are in, but they're just very few numbers. So it's going to be just give me a reason to cover a lot of country and put the glass to work and just look for white dots. Man, how neat. Yeah, it's been the, I've been on a couple hunts. One um, was my own in the Beartooth Absorkies. Kind of yep. not quite the same deal as you, not quite as the low odds as you do, but it's in Montana, it's the best odds or some of the best odds to draw a goat tag because they give 35 tags in there. Might gotcha. even be 50 tags in there, but it was just, I wanted the opportunity to hunt them so bad that it was just like, God, just give me a chance. And so I drew it in 2013. Uh, it was just an absolutely amazing experience. I mean, getting up to, and, and you get to experience it with your high country mule deer, and I did too, but goats are even a touch different because they're not looking for the, the tallest, you know, feature to feed on and then make their way up right. in the rocks. Like, they live in the rocks. Like, the, the steepest and nastiest country you can find, they want to live right in the middle of it. You know, just the steepest, biggest face at 3,000 feet, that's where they want to be, it seems like, you know. So it, it was really cool experience to get back there. And then when you start glassing, like you're actually glassing country that you've never actually glassed before. Because I've always glassed – you're glassing the greens and the fringes right. and things of that nature. But now all of a sudden in Montana or where you're at, the Tetons is going to be amazing to hunt those things. But all of a sudden you're glassing all these rock tops and these big cliffs and these – you right. know, just these really extreme places. And it's fun to run your eyes over. Over that country and look for those things and then just the species they are so sure-footed like I, you know i said before i drew a goat tag is oh, i can go anywhere a goat can go no i can't <laughs> i can't go anywhere close they play on slopes that i die on with ropes you know it's crazy yeah. what they can walk those vertical slopes and then the young billies will be butting each other trying to knock each other off the cliffs up there a thousand feet up they're just so comfortable with the steep and they like that's the one dangerous part about hunting goats is not pushing past your limits because yeah. I would see goats and I would see billies down off faces that would tempt me to try to get down there. But eventually I it just get too steep or it get to where I'm going to shoot a goat and I'm going to have to pick up the pieces at the bottom. It's also yeah. tough to try to shoot a goat and not have him roll down a thousand feet and bust his horn. So it's a real <laughs> challenge, but man, it is an awesome opportunity. Yeah, you know, I'm 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 ex- just yeah, exactly like you said. I'm just excited to have a mountain goat tag with my name on it and an opportunity, you know, and the 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 bad like the part I just don't like about the whole scenario is the whole eradication aspect is that for those of us that have tags and everything for all the rest of the goats that don't get hunted, the whole idea is to put people in a helicopter this winter and shoot them and leave them lay on the side of a hill, which, you know, as a hunter, a conservationist, and I don't even think I could get in a fight with an anti hunter about this. I don't agree with it. I mean, I wish that was not the case of unfortunately the national park service and how they operate because it basically would take an act of Congress for them to allow us to hunt these goats inside the park. So instead of going through that effort to allow it, they'd rather just take a helicopter, shoot them and leave them lay on the landscape. And I just, Man, it just that that 
irks me pretty badly, but it does, you know, I'm, I'm happy that Wyoming game and fish, you know, opened up an opportunity for me to have a tag in my pocket and get to hunt them on up in the wilderness, which is going to be awesome. But it is going to be a bummer. The thought of not having those goats up in that range here in the next couple of years. Boy, that is kind of bittersweet because usually when you're up on these, these hunts are in these special places. It's special to see those animals up there and have that experience. And your whole thought is always to come back or to bring family back or to hunt it again or the cool spots that these goats are hanging out with. So, yeah, I can see how you're uh, struggling with that back and forth. But, you know, it's it's really out of your hands. And like you say, it's a great thing that Wyoming Fish and Game put this together so some guys can have an opportunity to hunt, use the meat, and have this quality experience. And and, you know, I guess the thing is, is the Park Service is trying to look out for the bigger picture. I don't know if it's right or wrong. Right. I haven't looked into it enough, but they're trying to save the native bighorn sheep herds, which are just – the bighorn sheep are so susceptible to that pneumonia, to disease and things. And so they're trying to take care of those sheep so they can remain wild, while the goat populations tend to just thrive in some of these other areas. So it's not like goats are going to go extinct. So. I mean, I guess you just got to look at it as a bigger picture and something you really oh, yeah. can't change and, like, just try to enjoy your experience up there, which I'm sure you will. But the Tetons, oh, my God, is that place going to be amazing to look for goats in? I don't think you could pick a better place to go hunt goats. I mean, as far oh, as – um, It's going to be pretty impressive, I think, just yeah. to sit, sit below the main Teton range looking for mountain goats. On, you know, it's uh, – it's still kind of a surreal thought because I haven't been up in there yet just because the snow level still, but I uh, I can't wait to – just get up high and start looking for goats. I, if we talked in two weeks, I might be using more cuss words when it talks about how gr- awesome goats are because I'll probably have spent by that time 30, 40 miles of just beating myself up on the rocks. But it's kind of like you were saying earlier, my, you know, last night I, there was a, a, a peak that I've known kind of a lone billy or two has lived on in the past. So I was kind of, I was able to glass that peak pretty well. And I was sitting there and I'm sitting there kind of looking below the, all the nasty, rocky cliff stuff, kind of in those green sparse trees where I normally look for mule deer. And then I kind of like slapped myself and was like, that's not where he will be. And just immediately my spotting scope went up into the nastiest, roughest stuff. And because that's where I grew up seeing goats and, you know, in Idaho was in that type of stuff. And I'm sitting there looking at it like, if I even see a billy over there, it would take me a day and a half just to circle around this to be above them, let alone even be able to get down on them. I don't even know if I could, but, you know, that's kind of the – so it's a, it's just a whole new experiment, I guess, for me in terms of just the, going out to hunt a new species, and I'm really excited for it. But I will say the the only one thing tearing at my heartstrings is it, it is kind of taking me away from my, my mule deer addiction for a little bit, but I think I can combine the two a little bit as well up there. Yeah, absolutely. It sounds like it. Uh, I think you heard. I heard you say. I don't know if you said it on the podcast, but you saw a couple muleys last night. Yeah, sure did. It was kind of wasn't really looking for them, but when you scan in your binos and see that just gorgeous red right out in the green, it's pretty obvious. And saw a couple bucks. One was actually a. I mean, he's a he's a four point right now, and it's it a couple of my coworkers were giving me heck today about you know, well, what do you think he's going to be? I'm like. When it's this time of year, I don't ever dare tell you a buck's going to become something because you've I've seen bu- pictures of bucks that look like nothing right now and they explode in August. And then you've seen pictures of bucks that look like a dang nice buck already right now and you think they're going to be a monster. And then you just kind of stay even and don't blow up. It's just – it's so hard to judge them this early in the game. Oh, it is. Yeah, and you're right. Bucks grow at different – different times like a lot of times if you can see a buck that's just all bulbed out super heavy you know he's got a lot of growing left to do but they're they're just tough to tell this time of year i'm i'm with you um as it starts getting later into july you start to know what they're gonna have as they're down to their last couple weeks of growing but man oh man they're tough yeah but it's a no it was kind of nice to just you know, kind of got that whole, my heart beat went up a little bit, just the whole thought that it's, it's here, you know, finally velvet season and scouting is, you know, I kind of, you we all as hunters and we dream about it all winter and all spring, just this time of year is finally getting there where the bulls and the bucks are getting back up into their ranges and it's time for us to put in our effort to, you know, have a successful fall. And I, yeah, I can't, you know, I just can't wait to get up in the hills. And the fact that my mountain goat tag opens in August is kind of a cool experience. So I'll be able to, it's going to be kind of weird packing a bow with me in early August, but it'll be, uh, I'm sure I'll be getting my butt kicked enough and enjoying it. Wow. How cool. Um, yeah, I was going to ask you what time of year you were going to hunt them in. 
You're you're just yeah. looking for a goat at any time of year. You're not waiting for him to get haired up. Well, you know, I'd love obviously to wait till like the October range, but being that this is such a low harvest chance, I think any of the goats that are outside the the park are probably going to get pushed back into the park pretty quickly maybe once the rifle opens. So I as much as I'd love to wait till later, I think I am going to give it a pretty good opportunity early just to it, I guess it'll depend on what I see here in the next two weeks. If I don't find any goats outside of the park, I'll just go back into full mule deer mode and go to my some of my other areas I want to scout and then come back to mountain goat in between my mule deer and my elk season. But, you know, I have my elk hunt in November, so I'm kind of, you know, set on that. But I do have all of October, which is, you know, after Wyoming's deer season, which ends in early October. So I would have all of October to go after him, which would be awesome. But I am going to put a, a, some effort in to try to get it done with the bow here in August, I think. Oh, good for you. They are so fun with a bow and arrow. I ended up arrowing mine. I think it took me 11 days, three different trips. I was weakened warrior in it. I made plays on them. I moved up above them. I had close calls, but finally ended up arrowing them. Uh, goats are really tough to um, be able to identify, too, the males versus the females. Like, that's tough. I'm sure you've spent a lot of years looking at them, and I did, too, like always wanting to get a tag, but it's just different. Once you have a tag in your pocket, then you really start paying attention to it. And, and the nannies from the billies aren't too big a deal but a lot of times you got to get close a lot of times those nannies yeah. are going to have nine ten inch horns on them and the only difference you know is is the you know the the base or they're going to have um you know more mass the billies are and then you always look for the gland in the back yeah, those little black dots yeah so right on the base of their horns like a, a billy has that black gland that sits behind it so their horns at the base touch and are really heavy and thick and you can see that gland in the back it just it takes looking at a few. I'm sure you've been looking at a ton of goats since you got the tag. Are you pretty good at identifying nannies versus billies? Uh, I, I mean, I wouldn't call myself any sort of expert or anything, but I feel you know comfortable when I see them. I guess if as long as I have some time to look at them. But just like you're saying, which probably maybe some a lot of people that you know have never spent time looking at mountain goats or even thinking about hunting them. I mean, nannies for the most part they will have a longer horn than most billies. But well, it's just that long, thin horn because they don't get the mass that a billy does. That's right. They they all have eight to ten inch horns and they're all black. <laughs> so it's like yeah. good luck. Um, <laughs> but you can tell that you get pretty good at telling the difference between nannies and billies. But what I noticed, what drove me nuts, is I had to get closer to tell. Now a lot of times you can see nannies and kids or big groups and kind of tell what they are. Um, right. But sometimes you'll spot, you know, a onesie or a twosie. And you can't really tell what they are until you get to 800 yards or 1,000 yards and get the scope set up on them. Like from a distance, they can be really tough to tell. So that would be frustrating, like glassing a long ways and spotting goats and not quite knowing. Now, <laughs> most of the time you can tell from the groups and you can, you know, yeah. you can you can tell by the numbers. And then also the billies, they they just they're so big and so wide. They're the males of the species. They're just more stout, you know, and so you can kind of tell by the body shape as well. Yeah. And, and also if you can catch them taking a pee, that's another good tell on them as well. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a good point as well. Yeah, no, it'll be, it'll be fun. I mean, I'm definitely, you know, kind of just apprehensive of what I'm going to see on these two big scouting trips. I have planned. I'm kind of, I've planned kind of two huge loops that are going to definitely, that's kind of why I've been hammering the, from gym in the morning to hills in the afternoon and just pushing myself to be as ready as possible. Cause I know, I mean, more so even than the, you know, my mule deer anyway, that always beat me up. I just know that I need to be in as best shape and ready to go as I can to get after these goats. Cause they're not going to be living on top of an, a ridge or any, they're going to be up in the rocks at 10, 11,000 feet. And it's going to take everything I can to get to them and stay on top of them. And uh, so I, you know, I'm looking forward to just, kind of getting out there and getting an eye on the country and seeing if I can't turn some up that are in the legal area to go after. Oh, I'm sure you will. Um, and how fun with the bow and arrow, the bow is so fun, like up in that real steep stuff to yeah. get a stock and, and it is conducive to killing them. Like you, you got to definitely make sure that, um, you know, that, that you don't push yourself past your limit in some of that steep stuff, but how fun, I mean, the one I killed, like I remember coming down and, uh, you know, having to, to navigate ribbon cliffs to get down through and a steep chute where it's like kind of like muley hunting where it's like, I don't know if I can quite make that. I think I can get down through there right. and it's just really all hands on deck and bow strapped to your pack and sneak down. And then, 
Yeah, I shot it in a grass slope, about the gentlest spot you could shoot a goat, and it still <laughs> rolled 200 feet down and off a cliff down through there. Right. It didn't bust any of his horns, tore himself up a little bit, um, but it still rolled down the mountain a long ways. But it, what a riot. How fun is it to get up there and live in that country and look for those things? And it sounds like you got a couple awesome loops planned, so – I, I'm sure you'll tune, turn some up, especially with your local knowledge in that area. Yeah, I'm hoping that helps. You know, I've talked to a few people that are pretty in tune with that area that have given me some hints, you know, in pointers to where they think I should look. And so that's going to help. But it'll be fun just to get up there and just, I mean, like, like you're saying, I was kind of laughing. I don't know if I've ever talked to a goat hunter in the Idaho, Montana, Wyoming area that's had a goat not tumble at least two to 500 to maybe a thousand feet. And it just, that's the kind of terrain they're in. And I'm definitely susceptible to going, you know, pushing myself a little further than I should. And I've, you know, noticed that even when scouting mule deer, I've gotten clipped out before into a spot that made me pretty not comfortable. And I was able to get out of it, but it was a really bad situation being alone in the mountains. And especially with this goat tag, I really need to, especially, you know, when I'm alone a lot, I have to kind of rein it in on my own and just not push past and be able to tell myself that's not a safe thing to do because they live up in the country where one mistake on your part and it's it's not like you're just sliding down and grabbing onto a tree. There's nothing to grab onto once you start going in some of that country. Man, you're so right, Stephen. Yeah. Um yeah, it's just, if they are going to be in country, that's going to be too steep for you to get into. You are going to run into that eventually. So, yeah, you just got to keep your wits about you. Like you say, know your comfort level, and you're really good in the steep, and you're really good in the mountains. And a lot of that stuff, the problem is, is you can't really tell until you get on it. Like I know I've looked at rolls, like I can remember this one high country roll I did in Idaho where, you know, it looked like I could make it across the saddle and I didn't have to dip all the way in this drainage. I could stay in yep. the ridge lines and I started side hill and it wasn't too bad and got steeper and steeper. And pretty soon it's so steep to go back the way I came. It's almost easier to go the way I'm going. But it, it was definitely like I got through it. I kept myself safe, made points of contact. But it's tough in that country because the whole mountain is crumbling. It's all yep. loose up there, you know. Know? And and uh, like you say, one mistake and you could really pay for it. I remember after I made that roll, it's been a couple years ago now, I said, you know, next time I'm just going to play it safe. I'll just walk to the bottom of that drainage and walk up the other side. Like I don't mind steep stuff and in construction, I always do all the steep work and high country yeah. mule deer doesn't bother me. But eventually it's going to push you past your limits and you just can't make a mistake on I mean, you can't fall off a mountain somewhere. Yeah, no. And, it, you know, it's a uh, I definitely, you know, I carry the the little in reach mini for obvious reasons because I do so much stuff alone more for the probably the peace of mind of my mother and father back in Idaho so that I can hit a button if it really came down to it but it's uh I mean I'm definitely uh guilty of pushing myself sometimes where I probably shouldn't go and I'm definitely going to be paying a lot more attention to that in this country because it's just this is the type of country where you can't make that mistake because you're not going to get that second chance to grab onto something and it's not I'm not willing to die for a, a mountain goat. So I'm definitely going to have to rein it in and just make the right choices when I'm up in that country. But I'm just looking forward to finding them. And once I, you know, find them, then making the plan from there. And that's kind of the, the enjoyable part and aspect of it for sure. Yeah. It's unforgiving, but it is, it is part of the enjoyment is the challenge. It's yeah. just going up there in really steep country, trying to keep your wits about you and trying to figure out how to harvest a goat. And like you say, no goat is worth dying for. No mule deer is worth dying for. You got to come back to hunt another day, but it's within that challenge that you learn something about yourself too. And I, I, I just love traversing gnarly steep country and mountains because this mountain That's hunting that we do, it, <laughs> it is like it's mountaineering, like, but it's not just making it to the top of a peak and making it back down. Like you have to get up there and survive and, and then try to find your quarry, whether it's a goat or a mule deer, and try to put yourself within a stone's throw. Like I just – I love the game of it, you know. I love the process of it, but within that, there's risk, and and you just have to manage that risk. And I know you'll keep it safe up there, but it's definitely okay. going to test you. Yeah, no, and it'll be it's you know the other obviously interesting part of this hunt is like I was saying, they gave out a pretty significant number of tags for a small mountain goat area, and it'll be interesting to see how I guess hardcore some of the other tag drawers are, et cetera. You know how many people because. You know, for me, I think you and I have a similar view on, for me, you know, part, one of the main reasons I love being in the high country and hunting is I love being away from people and just doing my own thing and kind of my own la-la land and zoning out and just 
paying attention to me, the mountain, the next ridge, the next step in front of me. And that's kind of one of the biggest passions I love about it. And if it gets overcrowded and I'm starting to run into people left and right, it's going to probably take away from the hunt to the point I might wait till October after the crowds have probably gone down to go back up. And cause I just, I don't need to be button shoulders with people to try and, you know, get a mountain go. That's just the idea of the hunt for me is being up in big, high remote country is just as much of it as the actual getting to punch my tag. Oh, good on you. Yeah, you got a good attitude about it. I don't think it'd be too bad. Um, the unit I was in, I believe, had 35 tags. And it was a fairly good sized unit, but it was it condensed the people down to trailheads and places yeah. they could go and places where there was goats. And uh, opening weekend, it seemed like it was fairly packed, but you know where there was guys in drainages, guys camping, guys hiking in, guys going hard. Um, but, but really even the opening weekend, I was able to get away from them, find billies. Um, and, and then the next couple weekends up, I never saw another goat hunter. It was like, they went hard for that opening day and kind of burned themselves out. And you never know who's going to have the tag. And I know it's a small unit, but that was 35 right. guys kind of hunting one face and one main ridge line. Yeah. Um, so I, I I think um, I think you'll you'll be pleasantly surprised and be able to get away from the pressure. And guys just aren't willing to live in the mountains like you are, or don't feel as comfortable in the mountains as you do. To where I, I think you'll just thrive up there. You'll be able to find your own hunt. I I think. Yeah, no, I'm I'm not too worried about. It. I'm a I'm pretty stubborn when it comes to covering country and trying to you know go, go further than I need to if need be. And so it'll be. It'll be fun nonetheless. I'm sure I'll maybe see some people at some points, but I also kind of have some – one of the spots I want to hit is kind of one of the places I want to hit it because I just don't think other guys are going to go there. But I do know goats have been seen there in recent years, so it's going to be worth checking out. And for like the way I look at it, all I need is one. I don't need to find 20 out of the boundary. I just need to find one. Yeah, absolutely. Um well, man, how cool. Um, I'm really excited for your season to follow along and see how you do. Man, you got some good tags in your pocket. Yeah, you know, and, and I still – I this is going to be the year for me of late season stuff. I also have a late season Idaho muzzleloader bull tag, so that's going to – I guess me, elk, and snow are going to be one and the same this year. Man, you're going to get used to that late season, that's for <laughs> sure, man. Oh, man. Uh, a late season Idaho muzzy tag, good for you. Yeah, it's going to be a new experience for me. I've never hunted with a muzzy, but uh, it'll it's it's a new tag, but it's kind of back in a home area I grew up. So I, it, for me, it's more of a just a fun tag, a reason – gives me another reason to drive back home in December and see family and friends. And I've got some friends that want to go, you know, are jumping at the bit to go and help me out. And it'll be kind of cool to hunt these areas I grew up hunting, but hunt them from a winter, like a winter range late season aspect that I never was able to. So I have some pretty good ideas of where to start just because I grew up in the country and it'll be, I think it'll be fun. It should see a lot of elk. You know, I'm not going into this hunt expecting much in the way of looking for size. I'm more going into this hunt looking for just a good time with friends and getting out in the hills and another reason to be out hunting in December. Huh, how cool. A December hunt, man. That is going to yeah. be snow and cold, isn't it? Yes, it will. Yeah. Um, Might make my November hunt look warm by that point. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, it's definitely going to make your uh, August mountain goat hunt seem warm. That's true. Yeah, it is. Man, it's it's dang hot here, that's for sure, but it's got to melt that snow and green things up, so that's a good thing. God, you're saying that snow's still crazy. I was thinking about heading down for a scouting trip this weekend. The weather didn't look bad, but I know there is so much snow in the high country. The deer just aren't quite in all their spots yet, which is wild. No. Usually I start scouting pretty hard for them July 1st, but right. this year, I don't know. I think we're two, three <laughs> weeks behind. There's still a lot of snow, right? There is, you know, I mean, it's a lot of the snows holding in any basin that has a lot more north facing aspect and all that or anything with timber. But once you break above 10,000 feet, I mean, I was walking across a snowbank last night that's in the wide open on top of the ridge and it's 13, 15 feet tall. And it's, you know, kind of crazy. But looking at like a lot of that country, I think you and I have both probably covered in this unit for deer wise, like a little bit further south of Jackson and stuff. It's there's still snow, but I mean, it's probably manageable, but I think just like you said, I just don't think the deer are up in where they're going to be here in about a month, a month and a half to where we want to be finding them, you know? 
That's exactly right. We're going to find them in lower features, which then you're hoping that they go up where they live in those top drainages, but you really don't know where they're going to end up at. You want to scout those deer when they're in their summer routine, living in the tops of those drainages, the same places you're going to go find them early September, and then later in September, they're going to work down into it a little bit. But I'm with you. I almost think they're not in all their high country spots yet. Yeah, you know, and I'm sure some are, but that's kind of why I've been (laughs) – just kind of bite my tongue and almost been happy with it to have this mountain goat to focus on is it's going to, I'm going to focus on the mountain goat for a few weeks here and then come a little bit into August, I'll get back into mule deer mode. And by that time, you know, what I find I'll expect to be there come September. And maybe, so maybe it's a good thing. I'm not jump, jumping at the bit to be up in the hills looking for deer that aren't going to be where I find them right now. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. I got a, I scouted an elk spot last week and I, I got an elk spot that I want to check out. I may just wait another week and go to that elk spot as it's prime right now and then <laughs> wait to go look at, at deer um, in that Wyoming spot. But I'll work it out. It's going to be really fun to make some scouting trips and um, nice. I just can't wait till fall. It's going to be an absolute yeah. riot. Yeah. So um, we'll. Steven, thanks so much, man, for being on. I really enjoy our conversation. Man, that was like an hour and 20 minutes. It just flew by. <laughs> yeah, it sure did, man. That was fun. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'll be pulling for you this season. I'm going to check in with you and see how you're doing, and, and good hunt, man. Yeah, same to you, man. Please do. Be Stay in touch for sure. All right. Sounds good. We'll, we'll talk to you soon. All right. Sounds good, Brian. Okay. See ya. All right, guys. That's a wrap. Uh, great conversation with Steven. Um, I really like that guy. Like I say, uh, it seems like the, the majority of guys – um, I have on the podcast. I just want to uh, be good friends with and keep in contact with. They're just great people and uh, great hardworking. Like, like the, you know, there's there's so many common threads, but you know, these guys that you run into that are consistent killers, they're just such genuine good people, you know. And so, uh, I really enjoyed getting to meet them and getting to know them. I'm gonna keep in touch with them this year. I'm sure he's gonna turn up some giants. That Wyoming tag he has is um, out of this world. It is such a tough one to draw. So he's got a rare opportunity there, uh, which is going to give him a chance to really focus on mule deer. And uh, Steven's deadly when he focuses on mule deer, especially with all his scouting days. So he's going to turn up some good bucks. Um, They're going to be in trouble come season. And then that that goat tag as well. And he's got another elk tag. So it'll be fun to see what he see what he comes up with this year. And uh, so, yeah, thanks again to him for being on. Uh, sponsor for today's show is Six Hour. Make sure to check them out if you're in the market for optics. Um, make sure to check out that BDX system. Um, if you're a rifle hunter, uh, you can just get all, you know, your rangefinder, your scope, your app on your phone talking together to get you the right hold. Um, so pretty cool deal. And uh, yeah, like like I say, over there at Eastman's, um, gosh, we're just uh, moving right along, getting out magazines, uh, planning for filming, and yeah. Um, And then getting out really good podcasts. Gosh, yesterday was a great day. I recorded like three podcasts yesterday. Uh, So excited to get them released to you. It's it's such great information leading into hunting season here. So, um, yeah, super pumped on that. Been working really hard on the podcast. Make sure I get you guys some really good pertinent information for this time of year. And um, and just focused, uh, focused on my own training. I really feel like a... I feel like a, a fighter getting ready for a fight. I feel like fall is coming. I'm just so ready to cut these legs loose. So, yeah, running really strong. Uh, my dog Gunnison isn't feeling so good. I thought maybe I had him worn out running him too much, but he, he must have, like, a sickness or something. So he's just not been himself. Um, so I've been running solo here. But um, I think uh, Holly, my wife, is going to run him into the vet. She's pretty good friends with the vet here in town. And so run him in there. Might have to do a little blood work or something. Just figure out what's going on. He's just, um, yeah, the last week he just hasn't been himself. He's just laying around real lazy, real tired, um, you know, just not loading up in the truck the same. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure what he's got, a little sickness or something, or maybe he drank some bad water. Or I'm not sure, but we'll get we'll get to the bottom of it. I'll get my running partner back. Usually I can't I can't wear that dog out. He's usually wearing me out in the mountains. So uh, we'll get him back and uh, yeah, just uh, run coming into season here. I got a bunch of really good hunts coming up. I am so jacked. Uh, so yeah, just uh, going through everything with a fine tooth comb, making sure that bow is just shooting day in day out. Ton of confidence in that thing. Um, gosh, I've got all my gear and and uh, 
pack list ready to go. I don't think I need to buy anything. So, God, I mean, I am just I'm just set to cut myself loose here for hunting season. So I absolutely can't absolutely can't wait. I know you guys can't either. <laughs> Steven, uh, uh, Steven can't wait either. You can tell from the podcast he's pretty jacked too. So um, it's going to be fun this year. So uh, we're all going to go hard, and um, I'm sure we're going to turn up some good critters and get some good opportunities and just have some wild experiences, you know, out in the wilderness or the backcountry. So it's going to be fun. So uh, thanks, as always, for all the support, guys. I really appreciate it. Really appreciate the downloads and uh, support of the podcast and positive messages you guys send me. Um, it just reiterates, you know, that, that we're putting out the right information that um, connects with you guys and is helping you guys be more successful. And that's the whole goal of this thing, you know. Um, for me to improve, for you guys to improve, and to share that through the podcast. So, um, all right, that's a wrap. Uh, I'm going to get this podcast out of here. I got to go uh, run over to a job site here today and pour some concrete. So, I'm going to get working on that. And um, yeah, just check in with you guys next week.